Superb. Okay, our next talk is called the Going Forward, the Perspective Mission of Skepticism. A nice, easy subject, yes, with a, with a five-word answer. Uh, your moderator is Sharon Hill. Let me give you the, uh, the haiku for this one. Uh, Sharon and Barbara, Daniel, Stephen, and Jamie, nice basketball team. So please welcome your moderator, Sharon Hill. Testing, there we go. I said, we've already had this panel backstage. We used lots of profanity and we you know, swore at each other and everything. And so we're all nice and friendly now. We're all agreeable. So yeah, sorry, disappointing. <laughs> okay. So going forward, the perspective mission of skepticism sounds dull, but I think we'll do okay. All right, so let me introduce my panel here today. We have uh, Daniel Loxton editor of Junior Skeptic, author of two in-depth essays about skepticism, where do we go from here and why is there a skeptical movement? Barbara Drescher, education consultant for JREF, and she's written extensively about the scope and methodology of science and skepticism. Jamie Ian Swiss, JREF senior fellow and longtime skeptical advocate and pot stirrer. And uh, Steve Novella, JUF senior fellow, doctor, educator, and one of the top skeptical communicators in the world. So welcome our panel, thank you. So um, we have an hour, we'll do some discussion, and we hope to have about 15 minutes at the end for questions, so think about the questions as we're going through this. Um, this is a huge topic, and it's been done in many respects before, there's plenty of literature on it. So the purpose of this panel is to share some new thoughts about what our panelists have reflected upon over the past years and the ideas that they have. And perhaps some of these ideas will resonate with you and, and, and some maybe not so much. But uh, these panelists are leading thinkers and doers in skeptical activism. And I hope we could come up with some worthwhile information for new skeptics coming. This is their first TAM and uh, who just have a taste of skepticism, may not be aware of the nuances and the history, what skepticism has been and where it's going. And I think that uh, people who have been here, uh, everybody knows who these people are and uh, will get their viewpoints. So let's start out with some foundation. Real quick, let's lay the foundation, our, our nutshell version. When the John Q public hears about skeptical activism, they don't really understand what that entails. What's the skepticism thing? Steve, you wanna start us off? Yeah, sh sure. So uh, I have written about this a few times, uh, so I, I um, have a quick PowerPoint of just uh, jot points of those key areas that I think define what uh, I call scientific skepticism. I think Carl Sagan is the one who coined that term. It may predate him. So I mean, rationalism is, a, is multiple overlapping movements. Um, scientific skepticism is one part of that. That's what I do. Um, that's, I think, a lot what a lot of people here do. Not everyone, though. There's, you know, everyone has their own different take on exactly what areas uh, make our, they are passionate about. So these are the areas that define my personal activism. Um, and is, are the slides up? Okay. So respect for knowledge and truth. These are the principles that we follow. Uh, basically, skeptics value reality and what is true. We want to believe what is really, really true, not just what we want to believe. Uh, that philosophically, that follows methodological naturalism, which basically means you don't get to make shit up and you can't invoke magic or supernaturalism ad, ad hoc to justify your beliefs or your conclusions. You have to follow some method that respects cause and effect. Uh, we promote science because, let's face it, science is the bomb. Science is what, <laughs> is what works. Uh, science Bitches. is the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Science is... Uh, you know, the, the set of methods that actually work in terms of exploring empirical reality. Um, we promote reason and critical thinking, not the exact same thing as science, although critical thinking is a tool of science, it is a thing unto itself. Uh, we understand the difference between science and pseudoscience. So what I've, what I've spoken up to this point, you could say about any gen, you know, general scientist, but a scientific skeptic also has to understand pseudoscience, both in general principle as well as the specifics of each topic. Um, we definitely promote ideological freedom and free inquiry, because without you know, free exchange of ideas and free inquiry, the whole gig is off. 
uh, what I like to call neuropsychological humility, which is basically a deep uh, and intimate understanding of all the many, many ways in which our brains fool us, the flaws and, and biases in our thinking, our memories, our perceptions. Unless you understand how easy it is for us to deceive ourselves and to be fooled by reality, you won't understand the need for all of the other things. Uh, and we also do consumer protection. Uh, because that is, just happens to be a realm where you need all of these tools, and so it's just a natural fit for our overall mission. So that's it. That's, it. that's I think, is a good starting point for the general, you know, the, the basic scope of what, what I do, certainly, and what I think a lot of my colleagues do. Does anybody have any, uh, uh, they're in their, in a nutshell, description, or do we all agree with Steve? Say I. What he said. Yeah. <laughs> right. So let's, we've got the foundation. Let's, let's go forward. Um, Jamie, your mission, your audience. Talk a little bit about that. Start off with you. That's an easy one. Um, you know, I, I think the world is filled with everything we are battling. The, 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 it is very easy to get information about, about from the other side. The other side has open channel, unlimited access, a huge pipeline of anti-science, non-science, uh, uncritical thinking and so as far as the audience goes the potential audience is the whole goddamn world um, and the problem is is that we are fighting to be heard we are fighting to get our side out our side happens to be a pretty good and useful way of you of looking at the world but uh, the unfortunate reality is we have to fight to get it heard how about the difference between you as a person, individual, and you representing an organization? I'm much nicer as a representative of the organization. <laughs> um, you know, as a member of the org an organization, I, actually, I think it's an important question. Um, I'm very much, uh, I'm a longtime skeptical activist, and what that means is, is that I've, among other things, helped to start two regional organizations, the National Capital Area Skeptics in 1987, New York City Skeptics 20 years later. And part of what you have to do, and, I, and I'm very much a, a promoter and supporter of local activism for all sorts of reasons, and without giving a whole talk about that, I'll just say that besides all the obvious things a group can do as activists, whether they're writing letters or presenting talks or protesting or whatever they're doing or educating, I think a really key good reason for local activism is to find like-minded individuals and, and explore that social element. Um, and I think that's powerful and I think that's really constructive. But when you're forming an organization, besides making those social connections, it's really important to think hard about what your mission is. Not just because you're not operating as an individual. It's fine to have opinions as an, as an individual. And as, as an individual, you don't have expertise about everything. None of us has expertise about all of these subjects. That's another good reason to band together so that you can put your ex, combine your expertise. But it's very important to think about what your mission is and what your mission isn't. Uh, because without that clarified mission statement, you, you, we're, you just end up in a mess and, 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 and at counter purposes. And this has led to discussions, as, as we all know, in varying overlapping communities, for example, not to expand the discussion too early or too much, but as a local organization and as an organizational spokesman and as a public activist rather than a private individual, you need to understand something about the distinctions, for example, between overlapping philosophies like scientific skepticism as opposed to secular humanism as opposed to atheism. And first timers just coming here, and we have so many new ones at TAM, which is absolutely fantastic, often are not that familiar with that and want to know about that. I mean, you know, I've given three talks on the record, they're all on YouTube, just in the last year about those subjects. And those distinctions are important, and they're also not just you know, ad hoc. They're, I had someone just four days ago post on my Facebook about how they're not coming here to TAM and they can't support JREF and it's over some of these mission issues about atheism and so forth. And some people here actually answered that. I, I didn't answer because all I would have said was I, that I thought he had made a good choice and that uh, for his reasons and that I'm going to have a great time at TAM and I don't think I would have had a better time with him here. <laughs> but, 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 but the one thing in that discussion, if you will, was the notion that I've somehow, by, you know, be, by fiat, randomly declared 
what the so-called mission is, when in fact, as, as we know here, and as especially Daniel has, 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 has recorded, and I encourage everyone to read his work on this, there is a long intellectual uh, history of what we're trying to accomplish and why. Why bother being a skeptical advocate? Has 35 years of organized skepticism made a difference? Or is it just a social club for ultra-rational, naturally critical people? Barb? <laughs> well, You're going to be talking a bit about this in, in your talk? Yeah, I, I, th I think I will be. Um, well, I could just say yes to the second one and be done with it. But yeah. I, I think that is actually part of it. I, Jamie mentioned the community. I think that's important. and. It has a great deal of value. But it, the short answer to the second one is, well, irrationality kills people and it, it makes people you know, spend their life savings. The long answer, though, is that it's important for everybody in everyday life. Um, one thing that I, I do plan to, to talk about tomorrow is the fact that rationality actually leads us to our goals and being um, irrational lets other people decide for us what we want. Uh, it doesn't actually, it, it, it makes us give up our power, okay, to the people who understand how to manipulate us. That's really what rationality is. Rationality is avoiding, it's more than just avoiding biases, and it's also avoiding the shortcuts in thinking that allow other people to manipulate us. So when we are not thinking critically and not thinking rationally and not um, looking at the world through a national or a, a materialistic worldview, we're allowing other people to decide what we're going to get, okay? And we're not meeting our goals. And that's as an individual and as a society. As a society, it's um, higher disease rates because of lower vaccine rates. As an individual, it might be you know paying more for something that you really, that you don't have to because you didn't take the time to think through what your alternatives were. So there are so many benefits to skepticism that I couldn't even begin to cover them in 30 seconds. I would have, I could write a whole book about it. And I think that we have made progress. There are plenty of examples, um, you know, the bomb dousing successes that we've we managed to stop people from selling bomb dousers. Um, we have managed to do all sorts of things just by teaching, pe giving people good information, giving them alternative explanations for the, the evidence that they think um, supports some extraordinary claim, and teaching them how to cr think critically for themselves. So skepticism, it's not the end sum game. You know, we don't just uh, squash nonsense and make more rational people. But uh, I've, I've heard the, the skeptic referred to as either the, the garbage man, you know, taking out the trash, or the policeman. Um, Daniel, I think you've used some of those terms before. Uh, yeah. I have, although they're not original to me. Oh. I mean, it, one, of the, one of the great lessons of my career uh, has been that none of this is new. I mean, this, is, this stuff has been going on for a long time. Um, when, people, when people reach for terms in which to talk about the utility of scientific skepticism. We, we often reach for these things about harm. Uh, what's the harm, like Tim Farley likes to ask. Um, or we look for occasions where skeptics have maybe prevented harm or brought justice uh, to those who have been harmed. Uh, and I think those are really legitimate frames to look at this question through. But, but for me, it's even more basic. It's, uh, you know, what, what is the utility in any research on any topic? Um, is it worth knowing stuff? And, and I think that when you consider that the overwhelming majority of humanity believes one or more paranormal things, I think that it is worth humanity's time to have a few specialists who look at those things, try to figure out if they're true, study and track them, and uh, uh, build up a, a, a rigorous scholarship around those things over, over a sustained period of time. And, and Daniel, you wrote uh you wrote, you know, about what skepticism can be and, and where we go from here. What, what were some of your ideas that, that you see really working now? Well, I, I wrote uh, Where Do We Go From Here in, in 2007. It's available as a, a free PDF from the Skeptic Society. Um, 
in, in the document, I, I made the I made the very basic argument that uh, scientific skepticism in its most basic form to, to solve mysteries and inform the public what we have learned, that that is sufficiently useful and sufficiently uh, uh, specialized, unique, uh, that it is worth doing in a sustained way. And uh, I made that argument at that time because there seemed to be this sort of change in the air uh, that, that at that time people were not yet talking about very much. Um, a huge expansion in the, in the base of the skeptical subculture, an influx of new technologies and new ideas, uh, a new, new urgency in some of our, our parallel rationalist movements, some of our cousins and other movements. Um, and uh, I, I was worried that scientific skepticism would be, would be eclipsed, that the tradition I belong to would be lost somehow. But, you know, as the years have gone by, although, you know, I, I think I was to some extent right to worry, there has been some confusion in, in recent years, some, some speaking at cross purposes between people who have similar but, but not identical priorities. And um, uh, there's even been a little bit of conflict about those things. But I think another way that, that my concern was short-sighted, and my more recent uh, piece released this year, uh, um, why is there a skeptical movement? Uh, you know, I, I trace back the history of this paranormal criticism stuff a couple of thousand years. Uh, it's been around for a long time. And, you know, there, there are people in this room right now who have been sci doing scientific skepticism, doing this work for 60 years. And Not it, me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels like it. But, um, you know, that, that work has been going on for a long time. It will continue to go on. I think in 500 years there will still be people who are trying to get to the bottom of these things. Whenever there are claims that sound too good to be true, some people try to get to the bottom of it. And, you know, here in this room we have, you know, we, we have a thousand people who care about investigation. Uh, Tam still cares about the tradition of Houdini. It still cares about the work of James Randi. Uh, Tam has not <coughs> forgotten its investigative heart. Yeah, but you know, so but as a movement, I think you know, this sort of uh, addresses your issue: where to go from here? We can't lose our tradition, our history, our core, but we do have to adapt to the changing needs of society. No one's saying we need to keep at the, you know addressing the same topics, or we can't expand our repertoire. I think the skill set that we're promoting is is timeless and universal. But how it gets applied is something that every generation is going to have to figure out for themselves. Every generation of skeptics has to figure out what are the key issues, where do we need to focus our efforts, what are our challengers, who challenges, who are our opponents, who are our allies. But the skill set, you know, I think we de we're developing the skill set further and further and further, but that doesn't change. And that's, you know, when I went over my list, that's really what I'm talking about. That's the skill set of skepticism. And I think it's really tangential to the question of, to what topics do we apply it, right? I mean, we all need to, we need to know, you know, how to think logically and, and the philosophical basis of our opinions, regardless of whether we decide to apply it only to Bigfoot or if we're going to apply it to, you know, to more social or political topics or whatever, uh, it, right? So I think that in, when, I, when I see, like, where, the, where do we go from here starting from 2013, my, you know, wet dream of where the skeptical movement should be going is I'd like to see us doing what we're doing, but in addition, I think that we would benefit from developing that body of knowledge and those skills that I talked about into a real coherent academic discipline, something that's respectable, that's scholarly, that's re recognized within academia, and that has a much, you know, deeper influence on the rest of the intellectual world so that we don't, you know, what, uh, my fear is, is that we are relegated to the fringe, not because of our methods, but because of the topics to which we apply them. Oh, you debunk UFOs, that's a fringe idea. So you're fringe. It's like, no, but I'm promoting science, and science isn't fringe. But that's what happens. Science gets put on the fringe. And that worries me, and, I, and I'm still struggling with how we do our mission without relegating ourselves to the fringe. I think one of the challenges in that, that we're facing right now is um, that it, particularly those that, that don't come into the community from having a science background to begin with, having to ensure or educate those new people about the difference between that method and that skill set and the topics themselves. Yeah that it's very easy for human beings to conflate those because we do think in conclusion 
terms. We, we start with, this is what I already think, and then we start looking for the evidence that confirms it rather than either trying to falsify it or opening our minds and considering the possibility that we're wrong. And so because that's our method, kind of default method as humans um, of looking at claims, we tend to not really internalize that, that it's separate, that the skill set we're using and the methods that we're using really are a separate issue from the topics that we study. I mean, there may be, just looking at different science disciplines, yes, there are lots of different methods in terms of the equipment they use and maybe some of the experimental designs are different, but there's a general scientific method. You know, it's very, very vague description, mm -hmm. but it still has the same basic kind of philosophy behind it. And I'm not sure about this, I'm not clear, Steve, about this notion of, a, of making it, of turn, turning skepticism <clears throat> into a, into a, an academic discipline it, for the very reason you mentioned, which is that the scientific method and science disciplines and disciplines within science, whether it's chemistry or physics or biology, are well established mm -hmm. and well developed, and right. yet still, as you say, sometimes pushed to the fringe. So the point of, of accomplishing, right, making an academic discipline out of it is not in itself any kind of achievement in, in terms of getting the message out. And what we are, if anything, yeah. <clears throat> we're not scientists, we don't pretend to be as skeptics. What we are is promoters, consumer advocates, I like to say, of the scientific method and the scientific worldview. And, you know, we, we're not doing science, we are trying to explain and, and promote science. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, when I talk about skepticism as, a, as an academic discipline, that wouldn't be the entirety of scientific skepticism or the movement. It would be one additional piece that I think would serve our overall movement very well. So, and there so, are... So, so such as there is a philosophy of science yes. as an academic discipline, yeah. then it's a philosophy of scientific skepticism. Yeah, or There's even, also the practice of scientific... <clears throat> there are people doing science, using scientific methods to study questions that you, probably psychologists and other scientists yeah. wouldn't be interested in. It, it's, it's more bringing all of these things together and applying them in a certain way. So, for example, um, you know, come in academia, I talk to, you know, non-skeptical academics all the time. They have no freaking idea what we do and why we do it. They don't get it. It's just a complete disconnect. It's very disconcerting. Part of what they don't understand is they don't understand the nature of pseudoscience. Or they think because they understand science, they therefore understand pseudoscience when they have no idea. They don't get it at all. And when you try to explain it to them, their eyes glaze over and they think, that's on the fringe, that's not something I need to worry about, and then they get blindsided by it and it totally bites them in the ass, and then they're like, well, how did this happen? Then they go into defense mode. This, you know, that, but one anecdote about this was the, uh, a very accomplished, successful neuro neurology uh, researcher who studies coma, who thought that he discovered that his patient who was comatose for 20 years was actually locked in and fully conscious because of facilitated communication. And this guy who was a world you know, recognized expert in neurology got completely blindsided, blindsided by facilitated communication. And then when I explained it to him, he didn't get it. Eventually he partly came around, but that was an education, a hole in his body of knowledge because he wasn't a skeptic. He was a scientist, but not a skeptic. So how do we bring skepticism in a respectable way to academia? One more thing, one other point to make on this is that we ha where I think we've made the most headway is in the UK where there are professorships of the public understanding of science. That's as close as we get to what we do being recognized as a legitimate endeavor and it's a great step forward. We need to import that into the United States and we need to expand upon it. I mean, hi history is littered with the wreckage of scientific careers uh, in which you know, well, well trained, well qualified scientists who just didn't know what they were getting Linus into. Pauling. Yeah, ran ran up against the the reefs of pseudoscience, and uh, it's not because they didn't know enough about science; it's because they didn't know enough about nonsense. The you know the, the study of nonsense is itself a large topic. There is a lot to know, and in that respect, it's a, uh, Steve's dream of a of a, an academic skepticism uh, is, you know, it's my dream too. I. I uh, I would love uh, to have been able to go and get a degree in the same weird stuff that I study. Uh, I'm studying it professionally, but I didn't have the benefit of any training for it. I could have used it. 
um, I had to turn to the you know the semi-technical literature that the skeptic society and and uh, the skeptics movement in general has has you know produced in a kind of emergent way. But training would have been nice. It would it would have helped. And uh, you know I I dream of a, a situation maybe like uh, astronomy or paleontology or geology enjoy where there is both a core of trained academics and a very large uh, population of serious amateur practitioners. That's, that's the picture that I, I see when I look to the horizon. And, and just briefly, but Daniel, in your older piece about uh, the, where do we go, you, you talk about the, explicitly about this idea that expertise in nonsense is part of the skeptic's special arena and special area of expertise because scientists don't have that expertise. They don't s spend time studying that. And that speaks to mission because not only do skeptics have that, develop that expertise, but we are really the only social activism movement that addresses that specifically. The world, there, there are lots of consumer advocacy organizations out there, but they don't really address nonsense in this kind of, and pseudoscience in this way that we do. And this is yet another thing that distinguishes us from other sister movements like humanism or atheism or whatever, where we, we may share uh, some universal beliefs or philosophical beliefs about the world, but they, do, they are not active in those areas. That, that, that is a special and important area of what we do as consumer advocates. This is a point that I made in uh, uh, why is there a skeptical movement uh, out this year? Um, in the 1970s, when, when skepticism came together as an organized project, I mean, it had existed for centuries before that. Occasionally it had coalesced into something semi-organized. But, but the movement that we know now was born in 1976. And when that happened, there already were scientists. And there already were historians of science. There already were humanists, there already were atheists, there already were science popularizers. All these movements existed, and yet there was work that was not being done. And, and that's why Skeptics Organized, was to deal specifically with the project of studying and informing the public about pseudoscientific and fringe science claims. You know, I, what I'm hearing here makes me think of a, a skepticism that is multidisciplinary. Absolutely. Because what you're talking about, yes, there, it's true that most, I mean, science in general did not look at these questions, but there are scientists that do, that are interested. And it may not be part of their, you know, their regular day job, but, it, you know, in the field of psychology, most psychology teachers teach pseudoscience because that's part of what we do is understand why people believe in it, how misconceptions are created, things like that. So I think there's, you know, we've got, so many different, you know, people from different backgrounds here, and we all play a different role in what we do, and we kind of all need each other. It's very, not multidisciplinary, but interdisciplinary. You know, we all bring different things to the table because this job actually requires a lot of different things. It requires that we're able to communicate with the public, which most scientists are not very good at that because it's not what they got into science to do. There are some that are good, and there are some that are not. and Hopefully the ones that are good do it, but we need to be able to communicate to the public. That requires marketing, it requires communication. We need the expertise to actually be able to evaluate the information that we want to pass on in a way that makes sense and, and that, to make sure that it's accurate. We need people from all backgrounds, people who can recognize fraud um, and you know, uh, deceitful, um, uh, I don't know how to say it. The honest liar is just such a difficult thing for me to conceptualize, and I'm trying to now say the opposite of that. What's the opposite of the honest liar? The deceitful liar? Uh, well, yeah. The, the, <laughs> yes, the liar who does not admit to using lying as a method. That's well, the that's point. That's too long, though. <laughs> I can't say that every time I'm trying to say it. But you get the point, though. We need, we need you know, magicians play this big role in skepticism <clears throat> because they bring to the table something that scientists never think to look for because we're not looking for fraud we're looking and you're not trained to detect it right because you know as i, I like to say 
you don't get a bunch of microbes calling a meeting on the, on the slide and saying, hey, let's fool the big guy, <laughs> right? So all the academic training in the world does not make anybody any better at detecting fraud. And that's, that's, that's why you have the magician. A little color. Yeah. It's, it's sometimes been suggested that it was kind of a historical accident that those people who came together in the 1970s to, to form PSYCOP first and eventually a global network of skeptical organizations, that they came from so many backgrounds. I mean, we had magicians, we had philosophers, we had uh, journalists, we had... Uh, psychologists. Psychologists, <laughs> absolutely. And it was not a historical accident. It was a, a, a kind of consilience, a, a jumping together of all these people from different backgrounds pursuing the same basic problem with different, you know, different faces of the same problem and realizing that the, their expertise could complement each other and that their areas, their specific areas of interest, whether it was uh, psychics or uh, quack medicine, that these things had functional similarities, that, that they could be addressed as a set in some way. I, I, yeah, it, not an accident, but a, but a, uh, a, uh, a happy fusion, yeah. I, I hear a lot of building blocks and a lot of uh, bricks that have been laid down in the past, and, and here we are moving forward to the future. I mean, what's, what's the roadmap? What do we need to do now? Yeah, that's a hard question. <laughs> it's a really hard question. Yeah, I mean, if we if we knew we'd be doing it, yeah, you know, um, <laughs> maybe we are doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe we are. I don't know. It's hard to know. And, and to, how, how there's to no measure. roadmap to yeah. un unmap territory, which is really what we're talking about. So I mean, I'm I'm always trying to like not rest on what we've accomplished so far. We can keep doing what we're doing, and we're having success to some degree doing what we're doing, and that's great. But I'm always looking towards how do we take it to the next level? What's the next step? I don't have the answer. I maybe have ideas about what we can try. Well, for example, you've, you've used uh, technological innovations. Yeah. I mean, a skeptic movement has been really good at podcasts, apps, blogs, We jumped website. on Web 2.0 yeah. podcasting, blogging. It was like we were waiting for it. I mean, it yeah. was the perfect marriage to our grassroots kind of very intellectually driven uh, movement. And it, it gave us a real advantage because that medium really favors the person with the ideas, and that's like what we have. We didn't have an infrastructure to really get those ideas out there, so we took off as soon as that infrastructure was basically laid at our feet, and we're still riding that wave, but we gotta look for that next wave, because this mm -hmm. is only gonna take us so far. Now that Daniel's the ones, you know, we're still writing books, we're still publishing magazines. Yeah. Is, is that reaching a new crowd? Well, I, you know, I, I, uh, I hope to always. Um, we, we were talking earlier about about uh, you asked what Jamie's audience was, and, and my my audience is uh, whoever in the world uh, can get any use for any period of time out of robust information about the paranormal or the pseudoscience. Uh, you know, the, those people are old and young. They're they're people of faith. They're non-believers. They're they're people of all countries. Uh, we all come across these ideas, these claims that seem too good to be true, and all of us have at some point in our life the, the, uh, the need to find out. Um, and so, you know, I try to be available to that broad, broad audience to the, to the, uh, to the maximum degree. And w one of the ways I try to do that is by not selling a, you know, a grand unified Daniel Loxtonism. You know, I, uh, I, I'm a human being, I'm, I'm complicated, I've got a, a huge portfolio of beliefs and preferences, and most of those I am not selling in my work. I'm not selling a worldview, I'm just selling the most robust information I'm able to provide. And, and Jamie, you're, you're reaching an audience that is maybe you know, entertainment oriented and, and, and not necessarily scientific oriented. Uh, what do you have planned for the future? What, what's your outlook? Uh, well, what I, what I think might be best for the, what I'm most interested in in the skeptical movement may not be the thing that I directly am, am doing in the world because I, I think that education, science education, critical thinking education, and getting that education to start earlier and as early as possible is a real priority for the movement. Everything we're doing I, I think is right and everything we're doing is what we're always going to be doing because there's a million leaks that we're always going to be trying to plug the holes in. There's always going to be alternative medicine. There's always going to be uh, fraud, uh, and deliberate you know, cons uh, and scams. There's always going to be pseudoscience. Uh, so working on these things and trying to, to 
put out information and debunking, which is a very important part of our role we haven't actually explicitly mentioned. It's actually an important part of the role of skepticism for, because it's part of the educational process. By debunking, you're offering an alternative explanation, which happens to be the real explanation of how things work. Um, and so debunking is a key role, another role that skeptics take that others, other movements don't. Um, but all of that does connect to the notion of what is critical thinking, what, what, is the, what are the methods of science. Uh, you know, Ch my friend and longtime friend and colleague Chip Denman, uh, who's on the board at JREF, uh, used to teach a course at the University of Maryland in critical thinking and, and, and science. It was a terrific, terrific class uh, that I guess lectured in a number of times. And, but, but the only thing wrong with it, it was a college freshman class. When to me, it should be a third grade class, you know, instead of teaching kids in high school to memorize the periodic table of the elements before they know if they're going to be chemists or not, we sh they should be learning what is the scientific method. This is why. And when the average person, I get into a conversation, as, and, and with educators too, I, I recently had a meeting with a college educator who wanted to talk about creating a critical thinking course, uh, and uh, I talked to her about Mythbusters. And, get, and getting kids to watch Mythbusters. My, my, we don't watch much tele television at, in our home, but my kids have unlimited access to <laughs> Mythbusters. If, if they're desperate to watch something, they know they won't get a hard time from me if they just go to Netflix and turn on another Mythbusters episode because they're going to learn a little something about how the world works. So, so that's not what I do personally, but it is very, it is something I, I promote as a skeptic, and it's something we're doing at JREF. We're, we have these terrific educational units at, Barbara's been key in, and also Daniel, other, other individuals. We have these great units. We have one or two more that are just about to come out. Um, and they're, they're fantastic. And I'd they're out. Like, are they out? The, 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 so what are the two latest ones? We've, got, we've actually got four that, that are new to the audience, yeah. We have one on pareidolia, one on visual illusions, um, another one on uh, cognitive biases and heuristics, and one on power balance. Oh yes, right. And the last one, I, the most recent one I saw is the power balance, and these are absolutely fantastic, useful teaching tools that uh, you know we want to see in every school. So yes, I'm an entertainer. I'm a communicator. You know, Macon said one horse laugh is worth ten thousand syllogisms. I spend a lot of time reading syllogisms, but I'm, my job includes horse laughs, so I try and get up there and get people's wave my arms and get people's attention and try and say a little something about how the universe works. But in the end. Uh, it's, it, so much of it is after the fact for us. We're trying to close the doors after the horses have been stolen when in fact the first and foremost most important thing we could possibly be, be doing is teaching people critical thinking from the ground up. Before we get to some questions, does anyone want to add their last bits of wisdom, something we, we didn't talk about or didn't touch on, about where we go from here and ideas? I think I wanted to add a little bit to what Jamie was saying and, and one that hasn't come up yet about the future, in addition to everything that everyone else has said. That, that problem of getting to the younger crowd, one of the things that we have to remember is that we're, when we're reaching for that younger crowd, their development's in a different place. And so, we, yes, we can put a little bit of, of the applied skepticism, you know, talking about what is and is not, you know, bunk. Um, but teaching them to critically think starts with very, very basic questions. And probably the most basic questions aren't even related as much to science as they are to um, values. But it's not the value that's important. It's how you think about whether it's OK or not. And that's moral reasoning. Um, basic, basic philosophy questions for very young children is where I would be starting, very young. Do we have resources? Yeah, actually, there, there are some good books. I, um, I've covered them in, in blog posts on Swift before, but there's one called, I can't remember the author's name, there's one called Philosophy for Children that I really like um, that asks very basic questions and has follow-up questions. And the idea is to get kids talking about it in a safe space so that they think about alternatives and they think about future consequences and they think about all the things that maybe they are assuming about a question and they think about all the situations in which this might apply and realize that there isn't a simple answer to most of these questions. But the other thing that hasn't come up is um, community. We've talked about community, and it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. We're all here 
in part because we want to be together and be with people who are like-minded and, and we have fun together and all of that and um, and we want to rant and you know uh, and what, what is it disagree or agree loudly uh, yes what are they? Agree, agree vehemently vehemently, yes. vehemently agree <laughs> and but that's a, that creates a little bit of tribalism and sometimes that can get in the way I think we need to find ways to have um, an in-group that doesn't target other human beings as outgroups, or maybe tries to um, minimize the conflicts between outgroups, but still have that community together. Because I, I think we do need some tribalism. We need to have our tribe. It feels good, and it's not a bad thing because it helps us work together, but we need to control it too. Uh, you know, you made me think of something, uh, Barb, here, which is in terms of early lessons. Magic is actually a great early lesson. Um, it doesn't always guarantee a rational outlook. There are no shortage of whack jobs in the magic world who believe in a magical universe. Uh, but nevertheless, it gives a fighting chance to teach a very early lesson that says things are not always what they seem. And uh, my friend Danny Hillis, a prominent technologist, uh, some of you may know, among other things, his work with the Clock of the Long Now project. Uh, when his kids were growing up, he hired a magician to come in and give them all magic lessons, not because he wanted his kids to grow up to be magicians, but because he, but because he thought it was a, a kind of a fundamental learning tool about how to think about the world. Um, I've taught my boys, I have no desire for my boys, so I wouldn't wish show business on, you know, my, my enemy's kids, much less my own. Um, I have no desire for my ch kids to be ma grow up to be magicians, but I've taught them a few magic tricks and what's involved in, in, in per the performance of them. And there were really big ahas behind that, uh, that they recognized. You know, two weeks ago, I, 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 we have 10-year-old twins, and two, two weeks ago I brought the boys to the county fair. And we went on rides and we ate toxic food and all of that. But, you know, there was a big midway section with all the games, and of course, it, First, the boys want to play the games, and they're crazily expensive these days. So instead, I took them on a tour of all of the Carney games, and I, we just kind of went game by game, and I quietly explained to them how each one worked and what the scam was, and a couple of them that they could really clearly see and pick out themselves. And then later, we were having dinner at a, like a picnic table with a bunch of group of people, and some other people sat down, and I was asking, you know, so what have you been doing? What have you seen? And I, you know, out of nowhere, right away, one of my one of my boys with his newfound knowledge, well, don't play that basketball game because you know that hoop is is oval. And they had so much fun though, getting those ahas right and getting sort of with it, uh, that we went through that you know the midway like twice. And by the time we were done, there was no question of you know how come you didn't give me money to play the game. That was, that was not the issue. It was a lot more rewarding than taking home a goldfish. They, they took home some real life lessons. And wasn't the fun trying to figure it out for themselves first? Some, although, you know, it's real. I mean, well, my talk will be a little bit about this tomorrow. You know, you have to credit the con man. And the Carney games are pretty clever. And you would have a hard time if I walked through that midway with you and said, okay, how is this faked? You would have a hard time just, you know, just like, I always, you know, I don't get paid to fool just the dumb, slow students. I get, I get, I get paid to fool smart people. And so does the con artist and so does the midway game. Going, going to what Barbara was just saying about uh, tribalism, um, you know, it, it, it is really fun to be among people who share your interests. And, and uh, I come out of town with a huge high, you know, it keeps me fueled up all year. Um, one of the ways that I try to steer away from a kind of a tribal outlook, though, is just not to get too hung up on the, the label of skeptic, the you know, skeptic as an identity. Um, speaking for myself personally, I, I identify as a secular humanist, and uh, I happen to be an atheist. That's a fairly small true fact about me. Um, skepticism is work that I do. Uh, it's work I do professionally. It's an activity that I pursue that when I get up. And when I, when I come to TAM, uh, I'm most excited to talk to other people who are doing that same work. Uh, and I mean, I think almost everybody here is in some small or huge degree is, is pursuing that activity. And, and it's the activity, the common verb that, that I'm most excited about. Um, we only have about three minutes. So I don't know if we could manage with any questions or not. One oh, quick question. Yeah. Does anyone have a really good question? Really good Preferably question. formed in the in the form of a haiku. Of a <laughs> <laughs> right here, here we go. I'm Randall and Susan. This would be awesome. 
It's a short one, and it's a good one. So when we get on the elevators, to and from, up, up and down stairs, we happen to be on with a non-TAM attendee, and they ask, so what's up with this fight the fakers thing? What on earth do you tell them? That was actually my first question I was going to ask the panel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that is a really good question. We, I was at the meal, I was at dinner the other night with Chip and Grace Denman, and the waiter asked this, and I wish I could... Uh, Chip, are you handy? Where are you? He's over there. Rather than rephrase, George, could you run? See George run. Run, George, run. <laughs> and Chip, would you just repeat what you said to the waiter? Because I thought it was great. And I couldn't have done it myself. Well, I doubt that I can repeat it exactly because I get asked a lot. And it's always a little different each time because we are such a multifaceted group. But I think I said something to the effect that uh, we are pro-science. Uh, we are encouraging people to look critically at unusual claims. Uh, we sometimes look at the fringe stuff like, like uh, ESP and UFO, but the, the central thing that unites us is critical thinking, promotion of science, and wanting to examine things in a very critical, rigorous way. Yep. Evidence-based thinking about the world. I think that's pretty good. And awesome haircuts. <laughs> One question over there, man the green one more shirt. quick one. You see a hand? One quick one. One quick one. One quick one. Yes, here we go. Here we go. No? Yes? Oh, it wasn't quick, I suppose. Quick one. Here we go. Okay, when we were talking about skepticism and uh, what it is, I didn't hear anything about open-mindedness, even though I always hear skeptics talk about it regularly, and paranormal people always talk about it. Where does open-mindedness fit in with skepticism in the future? I think it's implicit in everything else that you know that we were talking about, and, and it, fundamental. It's open inquiry, you know. Yeah, it's absolutely it's fundamental. I, I I agree. And we also put out the fact that you know being open minded is often used in the same way as having faith or whatever, which is a way of dismissing any opinions that you don't agree. Or you don't agree with me because you're not open minded or you're closed minded. So you try to avoid using it as a dismissive or denialist tool. But functionally, it just means that we, we're fair in our evaluation of evidence. You know, if you can prove anything with adequate evidence and logic, we'll accept it in proportion to the evidence. That's, that's what being open-minded is. But, it's, yeah, it's implicit to science and everything else we were talking about. And that's right, because Steve said so. Yes. Yeah. What he said. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just like to add that um, please make a little mark in your program uh, of the, our speakers here. Please go home and look them up on the web, look, uh, watch their, their YouTube talks, read their blogs, read their written uh, documents, and, and really understand that they've done a lot of work in this field. And I'd also plug the Media Guide to Skepticism, which is on doubtfulnews.com, which some of these people have helped me with as well. It's a community document. And great to, to hand out as, as a beginner document. So I want to thank my panel. Very informative. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody. Thank your panel one more time. Very nicely done. Congrats.